So the black writer back in the day that wrote a lot of books that was the inspiration for a lot of these films back in the day. He basically was the person who I molded my entire career around. His name was Iceberg Slim. That's why I got my name. Ice-T is short for Iceberg. Now, he was a real pimp and a real hustler out in the street. But at one point in his career, he decided he was going to write books. And the books were so real. They were about street life and hustling and drugs. But the difference about these books was he always would show you the hard side of the street life. And um, he was the person that really inspired me to not want to totally live out this gangster fantasy, but learn to write about it. I'm your mama, I'm your daddy, I'm that nigga in the alley. I'm your doctor, when in need, want some coke, have some weed. Since I write about the street a lot, I like to give proper credence to the humanity of underworld people. Lots of writers dehumanize. If you don't believe it, watch some of your stories on TV when they touch on street people. They dehumanize them. They're not human. So the prime purpose and focus of all of my writing is not to glorify street people, but to give them a full dimension as human beings. They were stories about black hustlers mostly. Iceberg Slim uh, thing was he was a pimp and he had all these theories and, and game plans for, for controlling the world and basically through women, manipulating women, manipulating words, wordplay, con games, very big con man. Uh, so Iceberg Slim sort of represented sort of um, an older tradition of uh, hustling. Being rich and black means something, man. When you got nothing and you want everything, you gotta get to be the Mac. If there's one thing tougher than being the Mac, it's staying the Mac. The nitty gritty of the pimp game is that after you get them, you have got to be able to anticipate all the feminine wiles. But back in the days when I started, you really had to know what you were doing. You had to know how to control and how to operate a stable, how to dazzle, befuddle, bewitch, entrance, and hypnotize a woman. And not only one woman, but eight, nine. And to keep them in harmonious effort. And if you think that is the job, my friend, you ask any married man. Back in the days, like, the way they treated women was totally archaic, you know what I'm saying? They had no respect for women, you know what I'm saying? They had women, uh, doing any nails was okay, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, little other things, they would always, every woman was bitch, ho, this, that, and the other. But once again, it was a reference in the ghetto. But then after a while, Cameron Dobson and Pam Greer came out, and they was basically kicking much ass. And me, I could take it just as well as I can give it. When people look back at those films, people have said that those were like the first feminists in the film. I believe that these were just a way of black films trying to counter a lot of the sexism that was coming from the males. The Big Bird Cage, a strange and brutal world of men who are only half men and women who are more than all women. Where do you want to be buried, nigga? Miss nigger to you. I think that they represented those sort of super woman figures of uh, Tamara Dobson and Pam Greer, this sort of personification of black female power. I mean, it's almost like, uh, again, another kind of comic book kind of caricature, but it really, again, had a lot more to do with how white people perceive black women, which is embodying this sort of out of the ordinary sexuality. I mean, both of these images, that of the black male stud and the hot black mama, all come out of a fiction of the of, of white racist imagination. In these films, um, women also are very much um, often uh, degraded, or or their experiences are are distorted, um, and the the whole nature of the hero's triumph after a while it becomes trite because it's just, it's, it's just a repetition of what has gone, what is the, the, the sort of um, 
the, the form that's been set for us by these three early films, Sweet Sweet Black's Badass Song Shaft and, and Superfly. He's black. He's brutal. He's boss. Fred Williamson is boss nigga. It seems almost like every other week or so, there's a new black-oriented film, but sometimes it seems as if the same movie is, is, is being done and is being released. And then the movies, uh, many are, are cheaply made. They're, um, they're the basic old formulas, now done with African-American actors or actresses, or directed by whites or produced by whites. He's bad. <coughs> He's mean. <coughs> He's a loving machine. <coughs> He's mad. He's mean. He's a killing machine. <laughs> Let him give you a black shampoo. The reason they call these other films exploitation movies was because they were done by white directors, white producers. And a lot of times when you're in a white film, you get this, like, uh, act more black. Uh, you know, can we make them afros bigger? And stuff like that. So at, in retrospect, people look back and say, well, the white people took the worst part of what black is and made these films. You're gonna have to shoot me right in my face, Mr. Black. His rage was the illness of the times. Hassled by his soul brothers with his mother dying, he can only escape to the moon. When a black man bears his soul and tells his story, Top of the Heap, starring Christopher St. John, whom you last saw in Shaft. There's this whole audience that was hungry to see movies, but the movies got worse and worse and worse and made with less and less care as time went on until finally they ran it in the ground. This is the year of the Black Gestapo, the new masters. We got a new deal now. You shoot one of my soldiers and I shoot one of your gorillas. The Black Gestapo, victory through vengeance for the new masters, rated R. That's why it gets the name that it has, black exploitation, in that the, the audience, the black audience, has a real need for heroic, assertive, aggressive figures, and figures that have a cultural definition. Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde. But the audience has that need, but the movies don't necessarily answer the need, and certainly not in, in realistic terms. The movies touch on the need. So the audience eventually, um, by the really by 70 by 75 the the black exploitation era is really over i'm so glad i've got my own I'm so glad that i can see my life's a natural high the man can't put no thing on me i'm so glad i've got my own I'm so glad that i can see my life's a natural high the man can't put no thing on me it's a sad day these films died, you know, and it's still hard today to get anybody to say something good about these films, you know. One thing I like to say is that I hope you guys got something out of this tonight, you know. These are the films I grew up on. These are part of black culture. All you hip-hop fans out there, this is where it all comes from, you know what I'm saying? And never turn around and say something is negative till you truly understand it, you know what I'm saying? This is a time in black film history that has to be remembered positively because this is what started us. This was our first chance. Can't knock it. So peace. I hope you enjoy yourself. And in the words of Sweet Sweet Back, you know, all badass niggas are gonna come back and claim they dudes. You know what I'm saying? I'm out of here. Keep them videos rolling, you know what I'm saying? Where is Dolomite? Dolomite's in the studio. I gotta go. Peace. Y'all stay in here. Some peace of mind with a little love I'm trying to find. This could be such a beautiful world with a wonderful girl.